I'd like to hand over now to um, Prokar Dasgupta, Editor-in-Chief of BJU International, who's going to formally announce the winner of the best paper published in the BJUI last year, Prokar. Good morning, Rob. Ladies and gentlemen, such fun to be back in Manchester again. This is a subject very, very close to my heart. In fact, the May editorial talks about a journey of toxins through capsaicin, resnifer toxin, and now botulinum toxin A. I spent nearly 15 years researching this myself. We thought of various ways it might act. There are now new receptor targets, TRIP M8, for example. Watch this space. I think this is a very exciting time for the overactive bladder and functional urology. The John Blandy Prize is awarded to the best paper from the UK and Europe. This time we had a very uh, testing field, shall I say. Five equally good papers, the highest cited over the past year, were selected. And then they were independently judged by a panel from the BJUI, each of them blind to what the other was thinking. The majority voted for Donna Daly and Valerie Collins from Sheffield. The paper is entitled, Honor Botulinum Toxin A Significantly Attenuates Bladder Afrin Nerve Firing and Inhibits ATP Release from the Urothelium. I've just been chatting with Donna. She's a basic scientist who works with David Grundy and Christopher Chappell. Always a nice thing to bring clinicians and scientists working together to develop the next phase of discovery for our patients. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to give you Donna Daly to deliver the BJUI John Blandy Lecture. Donna Daly. Hi, um, so I'm going to go through some of the work that we're doing in Sheffield and talk about um, the model that we use to study sensory nerve activity, and then I'm going to go through the data that we presented in this paper. So as most of you will know better than me, the urinary bladder's main role is to store and periodically void urine in a controlled manner. So as it's filling, the sensory nerves which innervate the bladder wall are continuously monitoring what's happening and sending signals to the CNS. Eventually, when the bladder becomes full, these signals go above our level of consciousness and we get the first desire to void. In normal continent adults, this signal can be inhibited until it's convenient to do so. And then eventually, the efferent nerves control the coordinated contraction of the bladder dome and relaxation of the urethral sphincters. So any disruption in this normal cycle of events can give rise to a whole host of bladder conditions. And the one that I've been interested in studying for the last 10 years is overactive bladder syndrome and also painful bladder syndrome and interstitial cystitis. So these conditions are more prevalent than diabetes and asthma, and although not life-threatening, have a real impact on quality of life. They cost the NHS in excess of 230 million pounds a year. And what's really worrying is that these conditions significantly increase in prevalence with age. So you can see that when patients start to reach the age of 65, the prevalence dramatically starts to rise. And this is a problem because our society is demographically ageing. Um, and also, OAB has recently been cited as the major reason that elderly people are institutionalised. So why am I interested in sensory nerves? Well, when I started my PhD in 2005, most of the current research literature at that time was um, around understanding the contractile mechanisms of the bladder and how the efferent nerves were working. However, it became apparent that the sensory nerves are the nerves that derive that micturition reflex, and also the cardinal symptoms of OAB and PBS are alterations in sensation. So by understanding sensory function, we may be able to better understand disease progression, but also be able to find new therapies for treatment. So you can see that the bladder has a rich sensory innovation. Um, 
don't know if I've got a pointer. So here the nerves are shown in green. Um, and in this cartoon, you can see that sensory innovation is conveyed by two nerves, the pelvic and hypergastric nerves, which innovate all of the layers of the bladder. So most of the innovation is to the muscle, but around 20% is to the inner epithelial lining, known as the urethelium. So when we talk about sensory function of the bladder or afferent information, we should also talk about the urethelium. So again, when I started my PhD, the urethelium was traditionally considered as a passive barrier, preventing any noxious agents in the urine from damaging the underlying tissues. However, in around about the year 2000, a lot of work from Pittsburgh showed that actually the urethelium is a much more dynamic structure, actively contributing to the way the sensory nerves um, sense fullness. And it does this by detecting the environment in the bladder wall through detection of stretch, temperature, pH, or even noxious chemicals, and then releasing an array of excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters, which then act on the underlying sensory nerves to fine-tune sensory nerve activity. It's even been suggested that disruption in this balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters may underlie some of the bladder conditions, and um, that by understanding this, we may be able to find a new therapy or at least improve our existing therapies. So onobotulinum toxin A is a relatively new treatment. Um, it consists of botulinum toxin, which is produced from the bacteria Clostridium botulinum, and there are seven serotypes, um, A to G. And the ones that are useful clinically are um, serotype A and B. And there are three forms of type A, onobotulinum toxin, abotobotulinum, and incombotulinum toxin. And most of the literature and most of the therapy um, is using the onobotulinum toxin A. In 1988, there was a study that showed that you could inject on, um, botulinum toxin A into the sphincter to treat detrusor sphincter dyssinesia, and this started to then grab a bit of research attention. In 2000, there was a seminal paper showing that botulinum toxin could be used to treat detrusor overactivity, and this then led to a whole host of clinical and experimental studies using the toxin to treat disease. And this eventually led to FDA approval for the treatment of both um, idiopathic and neurogenic detrusor of activity. So how does it work? Well, normally, um, neurotransmission occurs when a vesicle containing a vesicle membrane-associated protein binds with two proteins in the um, plasma membrane, SNAP25 and syntaxin, to form something called a snare complex. This allows the vesicle to dock and, and fuse and then release its cargo into the synapse. And most typically, this cargo is acetylcholine. This acetylcholine then diffuses to nearby muscle cells and causes contraction. And Botox simply cleaves SNAP25 and prevents the formation of this snare complex, thereby preventing the release of acetylcholine and preventing contractility. So it was originally believed that the mechanism of action for Botox in the bladder was simply by inhibiting contractility. And we know that from the adverse effects of retention that this is the case. However, there are several lines of evidence that suggest that Botox could also be having another effect, perhaps on the sensory nerves. So we know that it relieves those sensory symptoms of urgency. It seems to work at a lower safety efficacy dose ratio than was initially thought. There's been some experimental studies showing that Botox can inhibit sensory neuropeptides from nerve endings, and also studies showing that peptide release from the urethelium can be affected. So we asked the question of whether onobotulinum toxin A is firstly able to alter sensory nerve activity, and whether it's working via the urethelium or via a direct mechanism. So we developed a model in 2004 to study um, sensory nerve activity directly using an in vitro preparation. So in these experiments, we remove the bladder and all the pelvic organs and the innervation from a male mouse, and we place it in a purpose-built recording chamber. And this is continuously perfused with drugs, and, sorry, continuously perfused with Krebs solution and kept at a, a physiological temperature. We catheterize the lumen, um, and this catheter is attached to an infusion pump, and then we place another catheter into the dome, and this is attached to a pressure transducer and a tap. So by closing the tap and turning on the pump, we can fill the bladder and monitor the intravesical pressure, and at the same time, we then find those pelvic and hypogastric nerves, place them in an electrode, and record the electrical activity as it runs up the axon. The advantage of this is it allows us to um, record sensory nerve activity over several hours in a very stable way, and also under physiological conditions. We have an intact bladder wall, so all of those normal components that are in the bladder wall are still uh, intact. And it allows us to look at both the muscle and neural responses to filling. 
So I've got a little bit of a video um, and at the top. I'm going to talk you through it. So at the top is a, a video of the bladder, as I've just described, filling. And at the bottom is the, the actual recording trace in real time. So in the middle is the pressure trace. And you can see that at this point here, the tap was switched on and the pressure begins to rise. And as the pressure begins to rise, you see that this activity, which is the nerve activity, starts to increase. If we look at this in a little more detail, you can see that these are actually action potentials or field potentials. And we quantify this activity by counting the number of field potentials crossing a threshold, and that's shown here. So basically what we see is that as you fill the bladder, nerve activity starts to increase. And what you get is recruitment of different populations of nerves. So in our recordings, we fill the bladder to 50 millimeters of mercury, which is well beyond physiological parameters. And this is so that we can activate both physiological nerves, those nerves normally involved in filling, but also those nerves involved in noxious sensation. You can see at this point, the tap was open, the bladder rapidly, pressure falls back down to zero, it starts to empty, and nerve firing ceases. See that here. So one of the... So one of the unique features about our recording is that we actually record from a bundle of nerves in one go. So instead of just recording from one single nerve, we record from a whole population. Um, so you can see, here, again, a little photograph showing the nerve sitting inside the electrode. And here is that sample trace from the previous experiment. And if we look at each one of these lines, you can see the action potential shape. Now, depending on where those nerves sit in the electrode, the action potential shape will, will change. And what we can do is use a computer algorithm to identify those different shapes and then subcategorize our whole nerve activity into individual single units. And this allows us to ask particular questions. So, for example, how does a pain-sensing nerve, something that's V1 positive, for example, respond to a particular stimulus versus something that's non-pain-sensing and responding to normal filling? So you can see in this example, again, the bladder is being filled, and this red unit starts to fire much earlier than this large blue unit here in relative to the pressure. So the first thing that we did was use this model to investigate whether sensory nerve activity was altered as a consequence of treatment with onobotulinum toxin A. So in these experiments, we intravesically infused two units of Botox for 10 minutes, and we continuously distended the bladder every 10 minutes for two hours, and then we monitored the afferent response to distension. So in the untreated bladders, you can see that the afferent response to distension over two hours doesn't change. However, when we intrafusically infuse Botox, you can see a dramatic inhibition in this, the afferent response to distension, suggesting that mechanically sensitive um, sensory nerves are inhibited. This can also be shown as an area under the curve, and when we do this, you can see that the firing starts to fall oh, sorry, at, at about 90 minutes and continues to fall at two, two hours. Unfortunately, we never looked past this time point, um, but, but I'm pretty confident that this probably would continue. So we then conducted our single unit analysis to identify whether one particular subpopulation of nerves was being affected. But what we actually found was that both populations that we looked at, so low threshold, those ones normally involved in filling, and high threshold, those ones normally involved in pain, were both inhibited by the treatment of onobotulinum toxin. So at this stage, we know that onobotulinum toxin seems to be inhibiting sensory nerve activity. Because our preparation is in vitro and we just have an isolated model, there's no input from the efferent nerves. So we know that there's no parasympathetic ACH release. But there's a possibility that botulinum toxin was acting directly on the smooth muscle somehow. So we investigated this looking at passive compliance. So we just measured the pressure volume relationship in response to filling before and after application. And in the untreated bladders, you can see that there was no significant change. And this was also the case for those treated, suggesting that in this model, the botulinum toxin wasn't acting directly on the muscle cells. So this led us to then question whether the urethelium was being affected. So as I said in earlier slides, the urethelium is this unique dynamic structure which is able to sense what's happening in the bladder wall and then release a whole array of neurotransmitters. So we wanted to know whether these neurotransmitters that were being released from the urethelium were being affected by onobotulinum toxin A treatment. So we developed a very similar model, but much simpler, where we catheterized mouse bladders um, and by a two-pore catheter. This allowed us to fill the bladder, measure the intra 
physical pressure and then empty the bladder and collect the supernatant. And then we could take the supernatant using commercially available assay kits and assay it for the neurotransmitters we were interested in. So again, we applied two units of Botox um, for 10 minutes and then we looked at the response over two hours. So we found, interestingly, that ATP release from the urethelium was inhibited. We found no alteration in acetylcholine release and we found, interestingly, an increase in nitric oxide release. So this would suggest that botulinum toxin is having some effect on the sensory nerves. So this kind of fits in with what's already known in the literature. For example, we know that as you fill the bladder, ATP is released from the urethelium and acts on P2X3 receptors in the sensory nerves to excite the nerve activity and inform the brain that the bladder is filling. More recent studies have also suggested that nitric oxide is released from the urethelium and actually inhibits nerve activity. So these data would suggest that onobotulinum toxin A inhibits nerve activity either because you're losing that excitatory ATP signal or you're increasing that um, inhibitory nitric oxide signal. Or indeed, the balance between both of those things is affected and the overall effect is this change. So in summary, I hope I've given you an insight into what we do in our lab and I've kind of convince you that studying sensory nerves is interesting and important and may one day be the key to better therapeutic targets. I've shown you that onobotulinum toxin A inhibited bladder afferent nerve activity and in this model had no effect on muscle compliance but seemed to reduce ATP and nitric oxide release from the urethelium. What we didn't do in this study was investigate whether there was a direct effect on the nerve terminal because we didn't really have the technology to do that at the time. But there are a couple of studies now in the literature also looking at this so I think this is probably the case that both the urethelium and the sensory nerves are affected. I'd just like to take a moment to um, acknowledge Valerie Collins, who actually did quite a lot of the sensory nerve work, and our PhD student Marina Liaskos, and neither of those unfortunately could be here today. Um, thanks for your attention. Right. Um, I think, would you mind taking a few questions? No, I'm happy from, to take right? questions, yep. So any questions um, from the floor? Could I ask, I mean, you slightly dismissed efferent nerve activity, um, but it should still be there. I mean, you can electrically stimulate bladders and under TTX to show yeah. that there is efferent nerve activity. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm not for a minute saying that botulinum toxin is not acting on the efferent nerves. In efferent nerves, sorry, in vivo, that's probably the case. And in our model, there are efferent nerves in the system, yeah. but because there's no input from the spinal cord, because those nerves have been severed, there's no yeah. release of parasympathetic ACH. Now, you can stimulate it using mm. a neuro kind of field stimulator mm. or something, mm. um, but it's not something that we do. We like this model because it allows us to look at the sensory nerve activity completely in isolation mm. from the efferent system because the more things that you have going on, the more complicated um, the data that you, you get is. So this system allows us to ask, is something acting on sensory nerves independent from the efferent system? Because, of course, that is what we're interested in. Yes, program. Donna, the uh, interesting finding here is when you put two units into the bladder, you get a response from the urethelium. Yeah. Of course, on top of the urethelium is a gag layer which is pretty impermeable yeah. even to botulinum toxin, which is a large molecule, 150 kilodaltons of mm -hmm. it. Now, can you perhaps Imagine an experiment where the urethelium is removed from the lamina propria where the nerves are and the two are studied independently. Mm -hmm. Can that be done? Does the technology exist? Um, it, it could be done in a slightly different way. We could open up the bladder and remove the urethelium and we've tried to do that. The danger is that you then start to damage some of those sensory nerve terminals that are, are kind of in that layer. Um, it's possible to use chemicals to break down the urethelium and there are papers using things like protamine sulfate. Um, and we've tried that, but we haven't tried it with on a botulinum toxin, so I think it's a, a good point. I mean, that's one thing, actually, I didn't say, that in these studies, botulinum toxin was just infused intravesically into the bladder, whereas in the clinical studies and a lot of the other experimental studies, they actually injected it into the bladder wall. So I think the reason it's having such an effect on the urethelium is probably because that's the area that it's getting to first, um, and it's, it's having that. But I think if I was to inject it further into the wall, we might see a different, a different effect in terms of the compliance and... Any other questions? Um, 
That's great. Well, thank you very much for the presentation of a fantastic paper. Great. Anything from else for you to say, Prokar? Uh, okay. You've given me two minutes to say something. Else. Okay. Clearly, while this was the best paper, it doesn't mean that the rest of British urology doesn't produ produce great papers. Indeed, while the strike rate of final acceptance in the BJUI today is just under 10%. British papers have a 25% chance of getting into the BJUI. And that's not because we simply favor them. The fact is, you guys write good papers. The British papers are often of outstanding quality. And if you wanted to see the best of British in addition to Donna's beautiful piece of work, I refer you to the BJUI virtual issue just released today on the Best of British 2015. All the papers are completely free to download. You can read them, you can enjoy them, and you can celebrate the work that you're doing. Thank you very much.